As the Syrian civil war enters its seventh year, the fifth round of negotiations still continue here in Geneva, but with little hope for an imminent breakthrough. In the meantime, there is no ceasefire on the ground and the fighting continues, along with a worsening humanitarian situation. Mr. Jan Egelan, the chief humanitarian advisor for Syria, is tasked with chairing the special humanitarian task force here in Geneva. They meet every week trying to monitor the situation on the ground and coordinate all of the humanitarian efforts by the United Nations. This week, he spoke to TRT World exclusively to outline where exactly we stand right now in what's been termed as the world's worst man-made disaster since the World War II. Mr. Jan Egelan, thank you so much for being here with us on our show today. Um, I'd like to start off with um, the latest from the task force meeting that you're chairing. Um, from today, what's the latest you can tell us? Well, we are very concerned with the situation in the besieged areas of Syria. There are still some 13 areas that are besieged by either government forces or in Deir Sur it is uh, by Islamic State fighters and terrorists or Fouan Kafraya, which are uh, besieged by uh, armed opposition groups. Situation in all of these places of, uh, 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 is very bad. Uh, I am particularly concerned with the situation in eastern Ghouta, which is close to Damascus. It's an, it's an eastern rural Damascus. There are three, four hundred thousand people here. We need access to them and we need it urgent, urgently and we're not getting it uh, at all this year so far. And with the fighting still going on on the ground, how likely are we to see another humanitarian corridor opening up? I mean, having both of the delegations here in Geneva, has it helped at all? Are we uh, closer to getting any kind of deal in the near future? No, I mean, there is indeed uh, hope for access to eastern Ghouta. We are urging the parties on the ground, the government, uh, those who support the government and the armed opposition groups, to for a 72-hour ceasefire, a humanitarian pause, so that we can get into eastern Ghouta. Um, <clears throat> we ask for corridors so that we can deliver assistance. Our teams are ready uh, within 48 to 72 hours. We can deliver all that they need. I'm concerned for the nutritional situation. Indeed, they need food. Perhaps the most urgent thing now today and tomorrow is, is the medical relief situation. Mm -hmm. All of the hospitals are now non-functional, all of them. And most of the clinics and medical facilities are uh, either down or working on limited capacity. And this is in an active war zone. So women, children are bleeding to death because there is not a medical sector that can help them, them and the World Health Organization and other uh, medical relief organizations are urging for, a, for, for access to these people. And regarding the humanitarian efforts towards this refugee crisis, one of the landmark agreements was between European Union and Turkey, which has seen several obstacles in the way of its implementation. Now, how um, likely do you think this can be implemented? And if it fails, how is it going to impact um, the UN or the NRC efforts? Well, they, they must not fail. Uh, I mean, first of all, we, we need to recognize that Turkey is probably the most generous uh, country for, for refugees in the world. I mean, uh, certainly in, in, in the north, uh, certainly in our part of the world, is by far the most generous country. Nearly three million uh, Syrians now have uh, safety. In, in Turkey. It has to be recognized. It's not enough recognized. Secondly, we're very concerned with the, uh, as NRC, Norwegian Refugee Council, with the EU-Turkey deal because the European Union is, is denying the right of asylum 
for people who want to come to Europe, Europe for protection. <clears throat> we are active in, on the Greek islands and in, in the Greek mainline where people are stuck. They are not able, to, Syrians and others, to get to the rest of Europe. We're urging European Union to change it at, uh, its attitude in that uh, regard. It's very important that the EU-Turkey deal recognizes everybody's right to asylum, everybody's right to protection, uh, and everybody's right to avoid being returned to any place, including Syria, against their, their will. In Brussels, we have a, 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 a big donor conference next week. The issue of rebuilding and even return of Syrians to uh, uh, Syria will come up. I will be there and urging uh, everybody to not do anything prematurely. It is not possible to send people back to, to, to Syria in the foreseeable future. It is not safe um, it, uh, and the place is not even, uh, even close to start a rebuilding of all of the uh, destroyed housing. And looking at the grand scheme of things, I mean, this is a country um, where most of the population is either internally or externally displaced, and yet the fighting is still going on. Um, do you see some hope for it being renewed in the near future? Well, um, the fighting continuing will lead to untold new suffering. And of course, the battle has now gone from the Aleppo city area to the Damascus city area. Uh, I'm, I'm very afraid for, for what can take place there with hundreds of thousands of people in, in Eastern Ghouta. Uh, the, the, there are also uh, discussions about a, a, a deal for the four towns, which are uh, Madaya and Zabadani and Fua and Kefraya, pot potential movement of people from there we need to make sure it's voluntary and it's protected. So a lot of things are happening. Uh, I think we have to emphasize there is no military solution to this. There's not either a humanitarian solution. It's, it's, it's not enough just with, to throw blankets and food at people in the middle of war. They need a political solution. They need ceasefire, cessation of hostilities. Cessation of hostility is not working. Uh, it's, it's, it's gone in most parts. And they need a political uh, settlement. So that's why we all humanitarians hope and pray that here in Geneva there will be progress on these political talks because the civilian population of, of Syria cannot take any more suffering. Frankly speaking, Mr. Egelan, this has clearly become a proxy war with the involvement of countries like United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, even militia groups like Hezbollah. Uh, and it seems that it's not going to be possible to reach a political solution without their consent. Now, would you say that the Syrian people have become a casualty to the global geopolitics? I, I, I personally would agree with that, yes. And it's interesting how many uh, of international powers are willing to fight each other to the last Syrian. You know, it, it's, 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 uh, so yes, it's proxy war, it's religious war, it's political war, it's ideological war that others wage in, 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 in Syria. Uh, ho hopefully 2017 can change this. I'm still an optimist. We can, in 2017, have the year of diplomacy. We can have agreements. We can have agreements where the civilians really can influence the agreements, and not just men with guns and power sitting together and making agreements over the head of women and children and the wounded and the sick in, in, the, in the battlefield. I'm still optimistic. Uh, I'm working day and night still for these kind of agreements. For Eastern Ghouta, for the four towns, for the besieged areas, we cannot fail the Syrian people. 2017 could be the year where this changes to the better. 
And we're almost at the end of the fifth round of talks here in Geneva and not much of a progress seems to have been achieved so far. And with the delegations present here in Geneva, it seems they cannot even agree on what item to start discussing first or to focus on. And so it seems to me, how come uh, we're not having more of an international uh, representation, a more international delegation present trying to reach that final political solution? Well, the, the, of course, there is a lot of diplomats helping Stefan de Mistura, who is working ceaselessly on behalf of Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres to seek a solution to this horrific war. Many diplomats also help, including from the countries that also have also, you know, uh, physically assisted the various sites in the war. Um, but of course it's not enough yet, uh, that's why the war is continuing. Uh, the war in Syria has now lasted longer than the Second World War. It is, it is just unheard of that we let in 2017 this kind of a war continue. Let's hope that all, yeah, Saudi Arabia, Iran, US, Russia, Turkey, everybody now pull together to get these parties to agree at the bargaining table. It's only through a political compromise we can end this. There is no military, no humanitarian solution here. And in this political process, I'm really coming to the end here, uh, if we run out of uh, you know, options with the fifth round, obviously it's going to end tomorrow with an expected statement from the Mistura. If we walk away without a tangible progress being made, um, what do you think is going to, going to be next on our to-do list? I mean, when you wake up the next morning, what do you think is going to be? We need to now focus on this. For me, as a humanitarian worker, the, the to-do list is always get, get those who can help the situation back to help the people. So, so, I mean, we need the diplomats and the politicians back to do negotiations. We need those humanitarian workers to, to be able to deliver assistance. We will negotiate access to all of the besieged areas in the coming days. Today, we are reaching two, uh, one besieged and one hard to reach area of uh, Syria, Khan Ashia, which is for Palestinians. It's, 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 a, it's a small place close to Damascus. It's the first time we're there for many months. Um, we, we have been able to reach a number of hard-to-reach areas in the recent days. But we're not giving up. We, we will continue fighting for the civilians of, of, of Syria, and we urge all powers to help us. And, and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm very glad that we do have the dialogue we have with Turkish authorities and that we have Turkey's strong support for relief to and assistance for the refugees. And I guess the assumption is that as long as a ceasefire is not in place and the fighting goes on, there will be more and more humanitarian crises with more uh, necessity from the United Nations. And we shouldn't assume that the UN resources come from a bottomless well. Just looking at the bigger picture, um, how do you think this is going to proceed if the war still continues at this current rate? Well, the great picture is that too few countries uh, are donors to our international humanitarian operations. I represent the country Norway, where five million inhabitants, I don't know how many, uh, there are people in Istanbul, but it uh, could be the same. Eh? Close to 20. <laughs> Close to 20. So four times more people in Istanbul than in Norway. Norway is the top six, seven donors to the UN in the world. Uh, so, so is Sweden, population 8 million. Uh, we need more countries to really contribute to this great humanitarian developmental effort of the United Nations. We hope that the Trump administration in the United States will be as generous as the Obama administration was 
uh, there are some question marks there. No, in, in general, I'm also worried for the resources. Uh, would you call out some, some names? I mean, given the proportionality of you know, <coughs> their capacity, how much they can actually contribute, w which countries are we No, I, uh, well, I could, could see in general many of, there are some oil-rich countries that are giving a lot. I mean, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait are actually very generous. There are many others who are not that generous, especially not to the UN, the, the accountable multilateral system. There are several of the Asian growing economies. They call themselves, you know, the, the tigers, the, the economic tigers of the world. How come they are much smaller donors than my uh, small place called Norway? Uh, yes, so I would call out a number of the bigger economies, the, the G20, uh, you know, that most of them are giving less to international humanitarian solidarity than my own country is. And I'd like to ask about the general uh, refugee crisis. Now, this is uh, one of the most prolonged uh, ongoing conflicts in our contemporary world, and we're seeing one of the biggest refugee crises, really. And I believe it's just hit the five million mark. Of course, it's a milestone that now refugee number five million have left Syria and entered the neighboring countries. The first and biggest among them Turkey. Um, it just shows that too many Syrians have given up hope in a future in their own country. They've given up hope that they can, can really get security, safety, protection and a future there. We need to give back hope to the Syrians. That's what 2017 is all about. If not, the, the country will, will, will lose too much of its good citizens. Uh, they want to be in Syria, rebuild Syria, work in Syria, live in Syria. They don't want to be refugees, neither in Turkey nor in, in Norway. So let's give them hope inside Syria. Thank you very much.